a little bit to vaccination strategies. So I am pleased to introduce Ahmed Ali from the University of Calgary, whose presentation is titled, Determination of the Protective Efficacy of Two Vaccination Strategies Against Infectious Bronchitis in Laying Hens. All right, I'm gonna hand things over to Ahmed. Are you, are you seeing my shared screen right now? You betcha, looks good. Yes, thanks for this nice introduction. I'm gonna talk to you about determination of the protective efficacy of two vaccination strategies against infectious bronchitis in laying hands. Sorry. Firstly, I'm gonna give you a short overview about infectious bronchitis virus. Infectious bronchitis virus, it is RNA virus belonging to gamma coronavirus family coronavirus. It causes a highly contagious disease in a chicken called infectious bronchitis disease. It distributed all over the world. It induced severe economic losses in the poultry industry. It has pathological lesions in multiple body system. IBV is a primary respiratory pathogen. So it initially infected the upper respiratory tract, then leading to respiratory manifestation. However, some IBV strains can spread to non-respiratory tissues such as kidney leading to interstitial nephritis and the kidney damage. Also, some IBV strains can infect the reproductive tract leading to drop in egg production and deleterious effects in the egg quality, either in external or internal. IBV could replicate in the ciliated epithelial cells of different parts of a, ch of a chicken oviduct. As you can hear, uh, you can see here, this is the oviduct with whole length with different parts, magnum, isthmus, and chill gland or uterus, and their epithelial lining, as you can see here by the uh, red arrows. Occurrence of pathology in this epithelial lining during the IBV infection could result in the chickens to produce eggs with shell abnormalities, as you can see here. Mass IBV and Western Canada layer flux. What happened? During 2010, apparently healthy layer flux suffered from increase in shellless eggs of 30 to 40% for three to four days in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta. And the positive IBV samples were subjected to molecular characterization. About 70% of this IBV isolates were gene genetically related to mass type IBV. So our rationality and the objectives based on shellless eggs was observed in Western Canada Leal frogs, and it was linked to a mass type IBV isolate. The combination of life attenuated and inactivated vaccine in immunization schedule of pilots induced better systemic and local host responses in laying hands. So our objectives aim to evaluate the protective efficacy of this later vaccination strategy against, against mass type IBV induced shellless X syndrome. So our experimental design as here, we, we, we conducted our experiment on 50 d old SBF female check obtained from Canadian Food Inspection Agency. Then we divided them into two groups. One group was mock vaccinated and the other one was vaccinated as follow here. Firstly, we primed the checks with life attenuated vaccine containing mass serotypes at 1D old. At two, five, nine weeks, we bolstered them with three posters with life attenuated vaccine containing mass and con serotypes. At 14 weeks old, the vaccinated group was divided into two groups. One group was vaccinated with life plus killed vaccine containing mass serotype. And this is group named as key group. The other group was vaccinated only with life attenuated vaccine and named as L group. At the peak of egg production, we challenged three groups of the bird with IBV mass induced shellless eggs with a dose of 10 the bar of sex AD50 per each bird through the oculonasal route. The names of the groups changed after the challenge. The key group changed to key C group. So key C group is killed the challenge thin killed, vaccinated, and then challenged. Live vaccinated only, then challenged, named as LC. Non-vaccinated, challenged, called NVC group, and the non-vaccinated, non-challenged, named as CON group or CONTROL. We kept the birds for about two weeks, and then we did monitoring for the birds for the egg, daily egg production and egg production abnormalities and clinical signs, 
and we collected blood samples and oropharyngeal and cloacal swabs at different time points. At the end of the two weeks, we did euthanasia and sampling of all the groups. The results, our results, firstly, the clinical signs, as you can he see here, only birds in the non-vaccinated challenge group showed respiratory distress it started from CDBI and subsided at 10 dBi. As you can see here, the mean clinical score in the non-vaccinated challenge group was significantly higher, it started from 4 dBi until 6 dBi when compared to the other groups. You can see here also the peak of clinical severity of the signs was observed at 5 dBi. For the daily egg production, no decline of daily egg production could be reported in all groups. For the external egg quality and the internal egg quality, firstly, we observed no abnormalities in all non-challenge groups and in killed vaccinated challenge group as well. And you can see here from this table, most of the external egg quality abnormalities were observed in the non-vaccinated challenge group. It started from 3 dBi until 11 dBi, and we observed it with a lesser degree in LC group. Also, the, we can see here from this table, the internal egg quality abnormality were represented only by presence of watery algoin at different time points in the two groups. For the post challenge serum anti-IBV antibody dieter by the ELISA, in general, the, the control group didn't exhibit serum anti-IBV antibody dieter at 10 and 14 dBi. Also, you can see here from this figure, the serum anti-IBV antibody titer in the two vaccinated challenge group was significantly higher when compared to the vaccinated non-challenge group. Also, you can see here the most interesting thing, the serum anti-IBV antibody titer in the two vaccinated challenge group was significantly higher when compared to NVC group at the two time points, 10 and 14 dBi. For the peripheral blood T cells of CD4 and CD8 T cells collected 5 dBi, you can see here in the two figures for CD4 T cells and CD8 T cells, no significant difference between the groups could be reported at 5 dBi. For the IBV genome load quantification in the swabs, in general, no IBV genome load could be detected in all pharyngeal and cloacal swabs in all non-challenged birds at all time points. You can see here in the left figure, the oropharyngeal swabs, the IBV genome load in oropharyngeal swabs. At 3 dBi, the IBV genome load in the non-vaccinated challenge group was significantly higher when compared to the KC group. At 7 dBi, the IBV genome load in the NVC group was significantly higher when compared to the two vaccinated challenge group. At 14 dBi, no significant differences could be reported in all the groups. For the cloacal swabs here, you can see in the right figure here, at 3 dBi, the IBV genome load in both groups in NVC and LC group was significantly higher when compared to KC group. At 7 dBi, the IBV genome load in NVC group was significantly higher when compared to the two vaccinated challenged group. At 14 dBi, no, no significant differences could be reported between all the groups. For the IBV genome load in the tissue, generally, we observed no IBV genome load detected in all examined tissues of the non-challenged birds. We have seen only three tissues that have significant difference for IBV genome load, the trachea and cecal ponses and the magnum, and you can see here in the trachea and cecal ponses, the IBV genome load was significantly higher when compared to the other groups for the magnum. The IBV genome load in the NVC group was significantly higher when compared to the other group, except the LC group. For the gross lesions, no gross lesions could be detected in all the groups. For the histopathology, microscopic lesion is specific to IBV infection and ovary, magnum, isthmus, and uterus didn't exhibit significant difference between the three challenged group. Firstly, we can see here in the ovary heterophilic cell infiltration in the ovarian cortical stroma as shown here by white arrow, in addition to necrosis and the sloughing of ovarian cortical, ovarian uh, epithelial, especially in NVC and the LEC group. In the magnum, we observed only glandular dilatation in the albuminous glands in the lamina propria, in addition to sloughing and deceleration only in NVC group. 
ISMOS exhibited only mononuclear cell infiltration. In the, the uterus, the uterus exhibited the lowest microscopic lesion when compared to the other three parts of reproductive system. Only edema and congested blood capillaries could be observed. The conclusion. From this table, we can conclude that the two vaccinated challenge group, KC and LC group, exhibited significant protection against IBV infection and in laying hands when compared to the non-vaccinated challenge group in the parameters of clinical signs, serum anti-IBV antibody titer, IBV genome load in oropharyngeal and cloacal swabs at 7 dBi, and also IBV genome load in trachea and sickle tonsils. However, they didn't exhibit significant protection in the parameters of peripheral CD4 and CD80 cells at 5 dBi and also for histopathology. And the most interesting thing, the KC group showed significant protection against the IBV challenge when compared to LC group, in, especially in the parameter of equality disorders and IBV genome load in oropharyngeal and cloacal swabs at 3 dBi, and also IBV genome load in the magnum. At the, end, at the end, I'd like to thank my supervisory committee, our lab members, and all funding agencies. And thank you all, and I'm happy with getting any question if we have time. We do have time for questions, about four minutes. So I'm just having a look at the Q&A box and there's nothing there. So you get questions from me, lucky you. <laughs> um, I guess, can you explain about vaccine administration in the field for live versus killed vaccines for people in the crowd that may not know the difference? So the normally the administration of live attenuated vaccine can be employed through uh, three routes, either through eye dropping or drinking water or through the spray. For the killed vaccine, this by intramuscular or subcutaneous injection. Right, so I guess when you're thinking about commercial producers and they're looking at their vaccination program, um, would you recommend based on the results from your study that they just, um, assuming they can give the live vaccine relatively easy by spraying or adding it to the water, as long as they haven't had problems with Shellis egg syndrome, would your recommendation be to continue with that program um, unless they have some, some evidence of Shellis egg syndrome and then they might want to change their vaccination strategy to include a, a killed vaccine? What would your recommendation be? So recommendation regarding administration of killing uh, vaccine before the link period or the road of the administration of the vaccines? What is the recommendation? Well, it's kind of make? both because I think the limitation on commercial farms is not everybody has the labor available to handle mm -hmm. each individual bird to do the intramuscular vaccine administration for the killed vaccine. Yeah. And so I guess my question is, do you think that, um, the return on the investment of paying for that labor is worth it for the protection against IB, like egg abnormalities for IBV, due to IBV. So regarding the route of administration, you know, it depends on the, the mass of production. You know, when you, you have large mass of production, you know, um, the, the spray vaccination for the life attenuated vaccine, you know, it is not so, uh, so much practical because, you know, it, as you said, it needs a lot of labor. So we can, you know, recommend the, using the drinking water instead of that. And also I would, I would recommend, you know, giving the killed vaccine just before the laying period at, for example, at 14 weeks at, as we did in my experiment. This is uh, enhance, you know, the humoral immune and uh, cell mediated immune response especially in systemic and the, on the level of local and systemic immune response. Good, thank you. And there is a question in the Q&A box, yay. It says, can we say the protection came from the inactivated vaccine as the live vaccine did not provide the protection in your experiment? Yes, for the, regarding the, um, yeah, we, as I shown here in my table, in my last table, the, the only difference between the, regarding the protection against the IBV challenge, the, the group that 
given the killed vaccine, you know, showed protection against equality uh, disorder and also IBV uh, genome load in the oropharyngeal and cloacal swabs. And also, you know, the when the given, you know, the best way of the vaccine or the um, um, the preferable vaccine, you know, it has to, you know, decrease the shedding of the virus. Yeah, I would recommend, you know, giving the inactivated vaccine, you know, um, firstly booster the birds with life attenuated vaccine, and then booster the with killed vaccine before the link period. As we can see here, the, the KC group, you know, showed significant protection, especially against equality disorder and viral shedding. And, you know, viral shedding, you know, this is very important regarding the IBV, and this is what decrease the morbidity in the layer farms. Great. Thank you for your answers, Ahmed, and your presentation. I'll get you to.